All right. Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to Holmes Avenue Baptist Church this morning. I'm grateful that you're here with us. Today's an exciting day. We get to celebrate Adeline crossing from death into life and having a baptism service today. It's a wonderful opportunity to rejoice in God's goodness and grace. As we prepare this time of worship through the ordinance of baptism, I want to make sure you're aware of a couple of things for us. First and foremost, if you're a new guest, you probably see one of these flyers in front of you in the seat pocket. Make sure you grab that, scan that green QR code. We'll love to know that you're here and follow up with you about what the Lord is doing in your life. Also want to make note of giving. You're able to give in a variety of ways. You can scan a QR code on the screen. You can give on our website. You can even give through text or as you exit. But we have our new city catechism to look at today. We're looking at question 18. And our question is, will God allow our disobedience and idolatry to go unpunished? And the answer is provided for us is no. Every sin is against the sovereignty, holiness, and goodness of God. And against his righteous law. And God is righteously angry with our sins. And will punish them in his just judgment, both in this life and in life to come. You see, what this question and answer is getting to is, we are in desperate need of a Savior. We've committed sin, we've been broken by our sin, and we desperately need someone to make that right. God, in His grace and mercy, will not look over our sin, but He'll pay the debt for our sin. All right, well, as we consider that, that's what we're celebrating in baptism. That someone has paid the debt of our sin for you and I, that they have taken our place at the cross, and by God's grace and mercy, we're united with Him and we're a part of His family. And so today, as we have this moment of baptism, this is a day of joy, this is a day of excitement, this is a day of worship, really. We're celebrating God's grace and mercy. And so today, I want to encourage you that as we have this moment of baptism, I want you to remember that this is a day of excitement. I don't know if you guys have watched any golf tournaments. Maybe you've watched the Masters over the last few weeks. Uh, give me a golf clap. What's your best golf clap, guys? Yeah, yeah, that's, that's your best golf clap. Yeah, this isn't a time or place for golf claps, okay? This is an exciting day. This is one that we celebrate where someone has crossed from death to life. That We are celebrating that Jesus' name still has power to save. This is a day of excitement, of joy, of celebration. And so I want you to cheer, and we're going to practice this in a moment, not with the golf clap like you've just sunk a putt in the middle of the Masters, but rather... I want you to celebrate like your team just won the Super Bowl. They won the World Series. Maybe you finally showed up to work on time. Whatever your celebration is, we're going to celebrate like this has happened. So on a count of three, I want you guys to stand up. Give me your best clap, your best shout, and let's see what you can do. All right? One, two, three. Yes. Good, good. I'll tell you, you guys are better listeners than my kids because you nailed that, okay? That, oh, no, Perry's saying he did it. He did it well. I'm going to trust. I'm going to watch him. This is the type of celebration we're to have today. We're celebrating the fact that Jesus is still in the business of saving souls. And so today, as we go into this moment of baptism, we're going to rejoice, we're going to celebrate, and then we're going to sing and worship the Lord for all that he has to offer for us. So at this time, I'm going to turn it over to Pastor Brian and Miranda and let them lead us in this moment of baptism. Good morning, church. Good to see you, right? You can scoot in. <laughs> Well, good morning, everybody. We are uh, so excited uh, for this day. Um, this is a, a day for us um, that has been, as I put on Facebook on Friday, a day of uh, 10 plus years of prayer uh, where the Lord has been faithful and has answered that prayer of ours um, with, for Adeline. Uh, back on uh, Good Friday, uh, just a few weeks back, um, she uh, came to us that morning as we were getting ready and she said, I want to talk uh, to you guys about uh, Jesus saving me. And I said, 
oh boy, here we go. And um, so we waited till that afternoon when we had some more time and uh, she was with Miranda and I and uh, we spent that time uh, talking about what it really means to surrender your life to Jesus and uh, the work uh, that he has done for us on the cross. And Adeline has uh, confessed that Jesus Christ is her Lord and Savior. And uh, I will attest to this church family. Um, this has not just been something with us discipling her in our home. Uh, many of you have been a part of the discipleship of her um, in this church family uh, via our own personal family. Uh, many of you from Highland Park um, that have invested in her over the last several years. Trisha and all the volunteers have invested in her uh, with our children's ministry. Um, so we are humbled and honored that we uh, can do this today. And we say thank you for partnering with us over the years uh, to uh, tell her and teach her more about Jesus. So Adeline, who has saved you? Jesus. And do you commit to follow him all the days of your life? Yes. Amen. <laughs> well, my, my sweet daughter and my sister in Christ, it is my honor and privilege for your mommy and I uh, to baptize you here today. You ready? I need to step down. Okay. <laughs> All right, you good? Okay. All right, Miranda, hold her side. All right, Adeline, it is my humble pleasure uh, and honor to baptize you here this morning in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Well, church family, the worship team is going to come forward now, and we're going to continue our gathering this morning uh, in song. Uh, so if you would stand with us as we uh, sing the good news of Jesus in song. Just as you've got to witness the joy of this baptism, I want you now to participate in worship and song. And I pray that you'll allow these words to penetrate your hearts as to what this baptism is about and is a large part of what our sermon is about today, and that is sharing our faith with Jesus. So join us uh, as we sing. Bye. 
Father truly love us. Does the Spirit move among us? And does Jesus our Messiah forever those He loves? He does. Does our God again to dwell again? Oh, Jesus. 
Have a seat if you would. Uh, We're going to move into now our time of pastoral prayer uh, before uh, we move into our time of the message. And this week, uh, we are praying for Summit Church, uh, Charleston, here in the area. They meet on the campus of Charleston Southern. Uh, Some of you may remember uh, last year prior to Easter, they came out and helped us with a work day. They're dear friends of ours uh, at Summit Church. And uh, we are... um, you have the opportunity, church, when, when you go to leave this morning, uh, to see the beauty of partnership in action. You may have noticed when you came in this morning uh, just how beautiful the grounds looked. Uh, we had a work day here yesterday, and church, we were blessed by Friendship Baptist and their men's ministry. Uh, they came out here in full force, and they did a beautiful job, even helping us with painting the parking lot lines and all of that. Uh, and so I, I point that out to say every single week we pray for a partner ministry or a partner church, and uh, we cherish that time that we get to pray for them because we are so grateful for the partnerships that we have uh, with our sister churches. And when I was talking to Pastor Nick this week, I asked him, I said, what can we pray for you guys? And he said, can you just pray for us for wisdom as we have some things that we are praying for and trying to make some decisions on? And I said, yeah, absolutely. We will gladly do that. So we're going to take a moment. I'm going to be quiet for a moment and just have some quiet reflection, if you will. If there's things you need to be praying for, uh, even repent of or anything like that, do so. And then I'll also pray for us as Walter's going to come forward this morning uh, to preach the word and finish out our This Is Us series. So if you would, let's go before the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, God, Lord, we are so grateful for you. Lord, we are thankful, God, for the work that you have done Lord, that we have seen witness of this morning, uh, Lord, with uh, the Adeline's baptism, Lord, the change that you've done in other people's lives, Lord, you are in the saving business still, Lord, and you will be so until the end of time. Father, we thank you, Lord, that as your church, you have redeemed us, and God, you have sent us out on mission to proclaim and demonstrate the gospel so that every man, woman, and child in our circles of accountability have multiple opportunities to see, hear, and respond to the gospel. Lord, we pray that we would see much fruit come in the days ahead, continuing, God, this beautiful thing that you've been doing in our church of saving souls. Father, we pray, Lord, for our partner church. Lord, we pray for Summit Church this morning. As Pastor Nick said, there are things that he is asking for prayer for regarding wisdom with decisions that their elder team needs to make and the church needs to do with just things of moving forward or to the work that you've called them to there at Summit Church. 
So, Father, I pray, Lord, that you would give them wisdom. You say in your word, Lord, that if any of you lacks wisdom, ask, and you will give generously. So, Lord, we pray, God, that you would give wisdom to them to know and understand what they need to do in the days ahead. God, I pray that you would continue to use them in a powerful way as they minister to students at Charleston Southern and those within their church family. Lord, I pray that much fruit would come from that work. As we pray always for our other sister churches and partners in ministry. God, we thank you, Lord, for yesterday and the fruit that we got to see, Lord, of of just partners in ministry coming alongside and loving on us. God, we thank you, Lord, for Friendship Baptist and the work that those men did and our other sister churches. God, as we come before you this morning, Lord, now we transition to this time of studying your word and sitting under the teaching of your word. And Father, as we conclude this series today of these core values and looking at the the heartbeat of the mission, and that is evangelism and proclaiming the gospel. Lord, I pray, Lord, that you would use Pastor Walter powerfully, Lord, as he proclaims the gospel to us. Lord, that you would speak to our hearts this morning. Lord, if there's anything that we have in our minds or distractions that would take our focus off of you and hearing what you have for us today, Lord, I pray that those things would be pushed aside. And Lord, that we would listen to the words that you are speaking today through your servant. Lord, I pray, God, that you'd have your way, and Lord, that you would be glorified here this morning. We love you, Lord, and we bless you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Well, good morning, everyone. See, thank you for the, the back corner. I appreciate that, guys. Thanks for being for me, here for me all the, all the time. Well, my name is Walter. I'm one of the pastors here. I'm grateful you guys are with us this morning as we conclude our series in our core values. These are the things that we believe in. These are the things that we want to live by and espouse within the local church. And today we're going to be talking about this scary, messy topic of evangelism. But as we get into that, I want to ask you a question. Do you guys remember your kindergarten graduation? Anybody? No? It probably wasn't very important or impactful to you, but I can remember my kindergarten graduation like it was yesterday. It was one of those moments that I I would tell you just changed the trajectory of my life. It was one of those days that as I look back on that, I know that who I am today, the things that I strive for, were begun on that day. You see, this kindergarten graduation was like all the rest of our kindergarten graduations, right? You have the cap and gown, you take the cute pictures, you, know, you sing a song or two, all is there. I couldn't tell you what happened with any of that. But what I do remember is standing out the front lawn of Edwards Elementary, standing out there with my family, everybody's excited, and my father looking at me and telling me, looking me straight in the face saying, this will not be the last graduation you have. This is not going to be the last graduation ceremony we go to. You see, what my father was communicating was that he had a high school education and he knew that the greatest thing he could do was to work in a local mill to provide for his family. He knew that was the limit of where he was going to go. And what he believed was that if we were to continue to move past that, if we as his children were going to do greater things than him, we were going to have to do further things like going to college. I was the first person in my family to go to college and graduate. Like, this is the type of trajectory my father wanted us to experience. And and I can remember that day knowing as I look back on the things I've done with education, even working for a college now, that that moment, that day, set the trajectory for the rest of my life. That day changed and shaped who I am. It gave me a target to pursue. See, we're, we're talking about these things today. We're talking about this kindergarten graduation because we're all striving to be something, aren't we? Like we all have something we want to be at the end of the day. Whatever it looks like, whatever our goal is, we're all looking to become something. Now, as Christ followers, our target should be to be like Jesus. Our target should be to grow to be more like him on a daily basis. That requires us to not only strive to grow in the faith, but it requires us to live in a certain way. You see, I believe that as we begin to think through who we are and who Jesus has called us to be, one of the things that he has called us to be is ultimately evangelist. He has called us to share the good news of the gospel of Jesus to the world. 
Now, why might this be? Why, why would I say that? Well, when you look at the New Testament, when you see all the things that Jesus would say about his people, it's all rooted in this idea that you're now a new creation. You're a new person. You're no longer what you once were. Now proclaim to the world who you are. And so today, if I might, I want to take you on a journey through the Scriptures just simply looking at a few different passages to answer these questions of why do we believe evangelism is so important? Why do we believe Jesus came to proclaim the good news of the gospel to the lost? What are we to say? How are we to do these things of evangelism? And so today, we're going to jump right in. We're going to look, if you'll flip over to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 17 through 21. We're going to really start with this first question, why? Why is Jesus so concerned about evangelism? Why are we to be people who are committed to sharing the good news of the gospel? The words will be on the screen, but you can flip over there in your Bible. 2 Corinthians 5, beginning in verse 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Why do we care about sharing the gospel? Why do we think sharing the gospel is important to us as Christ followers? See, ultimately, we share the gospel because we've been made new. Paul tells us very clearly here in the scriptures that once we were dead in our trespasses and sins, once we were separated from God by our sin, once we had no hope, we were without life, we were condemned because of our decisions. Yet now we've been made alive together in Christ. See, Paul's making very clear there's a dividing line, there's a break between the two. That this dividing line exists to show God's great work in you and I. See, in this, he's saying this dividing line exists, this new creation has been begun. And with this new creation, we're to now do what? We're now to live out, to work out this ministry of reconciliation. What does that mean? Well, he tells us here very clearly that we're ambassadors for Christ. Now, maybe you don't know what an ambassador is. That's what our role is supposed to be in this kingdom. But an ambassador, just to sum it up, is someone who's formally recognized as a representative of a country or kingdom or specific person. So this is God himself telling the world, these people that you call Christians, they are representatives of me. That wherever they go, they have full authority to speak on my behalf. Wherever they go, they have the ability to proclaim things that are binding, just as I would say them. That if you see them, you are seeing a reflection of me. This is who we are. We are people who've been transformed by the gospel. And we are telling others about the one who transformed us. Notice here that Paul says that God is making his appeal through us. I want you to be very clear about what Paul is saying, that God making his appeal through us. He's laying out this idea that the weight of evangelism, the weight of gospel transformation, it does not rest upon our shoulders, but it rests upon God's shoulders. You see, God is the one who's doing the work here. We are merely his voice. We are the ones who are proclaiming his message. And it is through his Holy Spirit, through the power he has given his people, that he will do the transforming work. It is through him that this work of gospel transformation will be done. I, I hope you see that as an encouragement to you because I think it's a freeing truth in evangelism to just simply know that God is the one who does the saving here. God is the one who does the saving 
yeah, we want to be clear. We want to be compelling. We want to be truthful in everything we say. But at the end of the day, no human words have ever led someone to repent of their sin. No matter how cute your your gospel presentation is, no matter how polished it is, no matter how reasoned and articulate you are, your words are not going to see anyone repent of their sin. Yes, our words matter. But ultimately, the God who changes hearts and minds through his Holy Spirit matters more. At the end of the day, as we look at this idea of evangelism, God is the one who is doing the work. We are merely proclaiming the good news of the one who has redeemed us. We end this section of Scripture with this familiar refrain from Paul here. Verse 21 is essentially a short and sweet summary of what the gospel is. See, Jesus took upon our sinfulness when he didn't have to. Jesus would have been justified to dwell in the heavens and leave us to rest in our sin, but he chose to mount what is perhaps the most incredible rescue mission you could ever see in history. That he came and lived the perfect life that you and I have not lived, that we could not live. That he came and he became sin. He bore the weight of our sin upon the cross so that we might become righteous through our trust in him. You see, this is a summary of the gospel message. This is what Paul is pointing to, that we are representing this message, the hope of the world packaged in a single verse. This is what we are proclaiming to the world, that we were once condemned and someone came into our life, changed who we are, and now we have life and hope. Do you know who the hero of that story is? It's Jesus, not us. You know who's the one who's going to bring any type of saving effect to the world through that message? It's Jesus. It's not us. This is the message. This is all we have to offer in evangelism. This identity of who we are, we were once dead but now we live, should lead us to desire to proclaim to the world that we have been reborn, we have been redeemed. Now if we take a step back here for for just a moment, I recognize the reality that if you're here and you're a Christ follower, you're you're probably like me and you're going, yeah, I I really do want to share the good news of the gospel. Like Jesus has transformed my life. I'm a new creation. I'm no longer the person that I once was. Of course I want to share that message. And maybe you get stuck in the, what should I say? Who am I supposed to share the gospel with? When am I supposed to do it? Well, lucky for you, we're going to answer some of those questions today. You see, if indeed we believe that we are supposed to share the gospel, that leads us to this big picture question, what is it that we are supposed to say? Well, I think that Jesus has given us a good picture of what we're to say and how we're to explain the good news of the gospel in Luke chapter 8. See, in Luke chapter 8, if you want to flip over there, the text will be on the screen. We have this moment where Jesus then begins to interact with a man who's possessed by demons. So look with me at Luke chapter 8, verse 34. When the herdsmen saw what happened, they fled and told it in the city and in the country. Then people went out to see what had happened, and they came to Jesus and found the man from whom the demons had gone, sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. And those who had seen it told him how the demon-possessed man had been healed. Then all the people in the surrounding country of the Gerasenes asked him to depart from them, for they were seized with great fear. So he, Jesus, got into the boat and returned. The man from whom the demons had gone begged that he might go with him. But Jesus sent him away, saying, Return to your home and declare how much God has done for you. And he went away, proclaiming throughout the whole city how much Jesus had done for him. We step right into this passage here, and and this is one that maybe you've read in in your time in the Scriptures, where Jesus encounters this man who is possessed by demons, and when he's exercising these demons, he casts them out, and he puts them into the pigs, and the pigs run off the cliff, right? You're familiar with this passage, maybe. The point isn't what happened there. The point is the response afterwards, after Jesus has done this work. You see, everyone's in an uproar over what's happened. 
They can't believe this man is cured for years. He's been chained up. He's been running through the tombs. I mean, he has been a nuisance and a terror to the people of this city for years. And now he's just as normal as the next person, sitting at the feet of Jesus, fully clothed, looking normal, speaking, interacting with people. He's been completely transformed. Now, rather than being overjoyed by this, the people, they ask Jesus to leave. They say, I don't know quite what's happened here, but, you know, this guy Jesus has done something pretty incredible. We need him to go, right? This is kind of scary to us. And so as Jesus is leaving, this healed man says, hey, Jesus, can, can I go with you? Right? I, I want to go with you. You've done something incredible in my life. I want to follow you. And Jesus tells him, no. See, Jesus tells him no, and he sends him to his house, and he says to go home. Tell all the city what has been done for you. Tell them how much I have done for you. See, Jesus is refocusing this man's attention to a life of discipleship in his own village. He's to take the good news to his people and to share what God has done. Can I just tell you a truth about what we see here? We make evangelism really complicated when we start to talk about what to share. We, we make it really complicated. And, and I would submit to you that it's really not that hard. It really isn't. We're simply telling others of what God has done for us. I mean, that's what evangelism is. That if you know enough to believe in the gospel message of Jesus, if you know enough to follow him, then you know enough to tell others what God has done, right? I mean, this is a basic level of summary, but D.T. Niles once wrote that evangelism is just one beggar telling another beggar where to find bread. I mean, that is it. That is the message we have. That is what we're doing in evangelism. I, I, you know, I know it's more complicated than that sometimes, right? There's, you get weird questions. You get these crazy things people ask, and, and there's just a lot that happens in there. But is it really more complicated? Is it really that much more complicated than sharing the story of what God has done for us? Is it really more complicated than simply even sharing our testimony, right? You know, I think this is so easy that you can do it in 15 seconds or less, right? Here, I'll do it for you right now. Hey, my name is Walter. There was a time in my life when I was lost and without hope. But then I met Jesus. And now I have hope and certainty. Do you have a story like that? We've just had a gospel conversation. I've simply, in less than 15 seconds, I've told you about my life before Christ. I've told you about what changed my life. And now I've told you what my life has been like since then. And then I've asked the all-important question, what's your story? This is an incredibly simple, short version of a testimony, but we've had an interaction there. The person that I'm speaking with, they can now simply say, yeah, I've got a story like that. Here, here's what God has done in my life. And now we have a great moment of rejoicing with another believer. Or they may say, no, I don't. What would make you say these things? In that moment, we've had an evangelism encounter. We've had a successful gospel conversation. You know, a few weeks ago, I was in Boston and had a chance to go up there with some college students and to go share the gospel and work with local churches. And one day as we're working with some of these churches, they have us do a granola bar giveaway. And we're going to the public transportation stops in the city and we're giving out granola bars and invite cards to the church, right? It's a very low bar. Anybody can pull this off. As I'm standing at one of the tea stops at Boston Common, handing out granola bars, you know, plastering this big goofy grin on my face and just trying to get people to take these chocolate granola bars, right? Like, come on, it's not that hard of a job. I have one guy who walks by me and I go to hand it to him. Hey, would you like a granola bar? And he looks at me and just kind of waves me off. Say, hey, have a great day, man. Just, hey, we're going to be polite, right? This is who we are. And he goes up the stairs and then I see him turn around and start marching back down the stairs. And I think, I am about to die. That apparently in my southern politeness, I have offended this man, and I'm going to be killed here, and no one's going to know what's happened. Like, this is going to end very poorly for me. And he comes back down, and he's just big, burly guy, and he looks like, and he just looks mad. And he comes up to me and says, what'd you say to me? I think, this is it. I'm dead. <laughs> I said, I, I said, I hope you have a great day. And he looks at me, and he says, you know, I've lived here in Boston for 20 years, and I've never had anyone 
give a rip about how I was doing. No one has ever told me to have a great day. Why on earth would you care if I have a great day? So very like, well, just very honestly, like, I, I don't know you from Adam, right? Like, but Jesus knows you. He loves you. And I would think that if Jesus loves you, he'd like you to have a great day. And he looked at me and said, tell me more about this Jesus. Right? Here's the thing. Gave this, tried to give this guy a granola bar. It's nothing, right? It's nothing. Yet, if God can use something like a granola bar to stir someone's hearts and affections towards him, how much more would he do with our testimony and our obedience to share what God has done in our life? Simply this, if God can use a granola bar, he can use you and your testimony and your story. This is what we're to do. Simply proclaiming, he, hey, we have found bread. Here's where you find it. Notice I'm pointing to that empty cross. That this is what we proclaim to the world. This is our hope. This is what we have. Now maybe you're sold on this already and you're saying, okay, I feel like I can do this. I can, I can, I can, I can share my story. And I'll just give you a note, like if you're here and you're saying, I'm not really sure, I'm comfortable with this, I don't know how to do it, come speak to me afterwards. I'll go take you out the street and we'll go share the gospel with someone. We'll do it in about 20 minutes, you can go home and get lunch afterwards, I promise you, it'll be that quick, we can do it. But it may be your soul on this, you're saying, okay, I know who I am in Christ, I know what I'm to say, where do I start? Who do I even start talking to? Well, Paul's got that covered for us. You see, if you flip on over to 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 2, Paul's addressing this very question with Timothy. You see, in Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 2, he says this, And what you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. See, Paul is writing to Timothy here, and he's offering some encouragement to a fellow pastor, to a fellow Christ follower. And in this verse, Timothy command, Paul commands Timothy to share what he has learned with others. He's saying that you're going to share it with faithful men who will share it with others also, but you're simply to give away your faith. You're to share this message of hope with the world. See, Paul's explaining to us exactly who we're to share the gospel with. Essentially, he tells us we're to share with anyone and everyone we encounter. See, this idea that Paul is showing us is that we should be engaging in all of our personal relationships with the gospel. As many opportunities as we can, we are to share it with multiple people. We're simply trying to share the story of what God has done for us as we go to work, as we go through our neighborhoods, as we go to the supermarkets and the coffee shops we go to, we are simply, as we're living, sharing the story of God's grace and mercy to his people. I just want you to think about our city, Charleston, the tri-county area, and all that's happened here. We're experiencing rapid growth right now, and currently we've got a population of about 850,000 people living in the tri-county area. That's nuts, isn't it? In about three to five years, we will have over a million people living in the Tri-County area. It's crazy. We hear those numbers and go, that's a lot of people. Now let's compare it with this number, that on any given Sunday, about 7% of this area, this entire Tri-County area, is connecting, is worshiping with an evangelical church. That means about 7% of the people in the Tri-County area who are going to churches like ours are engaging with a church. That means there are nearly 800,000 people in our area that have zero relationship with Jesus. 800,000 people that if they were to die today, they would spend eternity separated from God in hell. 800,000 people. You might be asking, who do I share the gospel with? I don't think you have to look very far to find someone who needs to hear the good news. If 93% of our population is far from God and is going to spend eternity separated from him in hell, then I think we know we can share the gospel with literally anyone, and they will probably be hearing it for the first time. 
I know as you hear that, it might be a hard thing to hear, this reality that our city's getting worse. We as a church and many other churches have existed for 70, 80, 100 plus years. First Baptist has been downtown for over 300 years. And our city's more lost today than it has ever been. I, I know that's hard to hear, but as I hear that, I think, one, I want to grow as a Christ follower who's more capable, more faithful of sharing the gospel. But two, I have hope. I have hope because, as we've already seen today, Jesus is still in the business of saving souls. Jesus' name still has power to save. His blood hasn't lost any power. It's just as effective today as it was 2,000 years ago. I'm encouraged by this reality because as we look at Scripture, we see that God has been faithful to move in mighty ways throughout the history of His church. I mean, you just look back in Acts chapter 19. You don't have to flip over that. I'm going to summarize it for you. In Acts 19, Luke writes that in Asia, within two years, all of Asia has heard the good news of the gospel of Jesus. Based upon population estimates in that time, there was somewhere between 7 to 15 million people living and passing through Asia in that two-year period. And all of Asia heard the good news of the gospel of Jesus. You see, the same God who is working in Acts is the same God who is working in His church today. I have every confidence that our God is capable of reaching 800,000 people because He's reached millions of people across history. That the number of people who will be gathered with us around the throne of God will be billions of people because He's been faithful to work and move when His people have been faithful to do their part. Now you've heard all this and you're thinking, well, there's so many lost people. When am I supposed to share the gospel, right? Like, is it just as simple as I walk up to them and start talking? Is it as in a grocery line? Is there something I can do? Like, what, when do I share the gospel? Well, Jesus has an answer for us there too. Jesus has an answer for us there in John 12. If you want to flip over there, you'll see it on the screen, but... In John 12, verses 24 through 26, Jesus says these words. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Whoever loves his life loses it. And whoever hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. If anyone serves me, he must follow me. And where I am, there will my servant be also. If anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. You see, this parable that Jesus is offering us here is one that he's speaking to a group of farmers with, and it's something they'd be very familiar with. I don't know what you know about seed germination and all that. I'm going to show my redneck farm roots here, so forgive me. But in order for a plant to begin to grow, the seed must die. I don't know if you knew that, right? But the way germination works is that when the seed dies and cracks open, that's because there's a new life that is formed within it. That sprig, that green sprout that comes up out of the earth, the only way you reap a harvest is if that seed dies. You cannot get anything from your garden unless you have a bunch of seeds die to themselves. Maybe you can see where Jesus is going with this. You see, Jesus is following this example with this language of, of loving the world versus hating our lives, living for him. See, he's explaining that the only way we can truly follow him is by giving of ourselves and becoming more concerned with others. You see, if we're faithfully serving Jesus, we're going to look and act a lot like him. And if we're looking like Jesus, we're acting like him, the Father is going to be pleased with his servants. Now, maybe you're asking, Walter, what does this have to do with evangelism? Like, it seems like it's out of left field, right? You see, this means that we are going to be willing to put the eternal destiny of others ahead of our discomfort, our awkwardness, and our fear. 
This is what self-sacrifice and giving means of ourselves. That we're going to say, I know it's awkward, but I'm going to share the gospel with this person. I'm afraid to do it, but I know that Jesus is going to be with me because he's promised he'll be with me. I, I know that it's scary to consider sharing the gospel with people that you interact with, but consider this fact. There are people that you live, work, and play with who are separated from God because of their sin. There are people in your neighborhood, maybe even in your own home. There are people in the office you work in, with the organization you work with. There are people you interact with on a daily basis that are far from God. Maybe it's your favorite barista. Maybe it's the person who greets you at the checkout aisle every time you go through food line. I don't know where it is. But what I do know, that you are in relationship with someone or multiple people who are far from God and desperately need to hear of a saving grace from Jesus. Simply put, if they continue on the path that they are on, they will spend eternity separated from God and they will dwell in hell for all eternity. Yet, you and I might be able to see that story change if we play our part in proclaiming the good news of what Jesus has done for us. That we are merely instruments in the hands of the Redeemer, proclaiming His goodness, simply sharing what He has done for us. Yet in that moment, God in His grace and mercy might change their hearts so that they finally hear and respond to this good news that Jesus has come to seek and save the lost. Charles Spurgeon said this in a sermon in 1860. If sinners be damned, at least let them leap to hell over our dead bodies. And if they perish, let them perish with our arms wrapped around their knees, imploring them to stay. If hell must be filled, let it be filled in the teeth of our exertions and let not one go unwarned and unprayed for. Simply put, this is the heart of the Father right there. This is the heart of the Father, that his people would recklessly live so that it, the world might know of who he is and what he has done. I, I would just simply ask you this. What is your comfort worth? What is your comfort worth? Are you willing to live your life in comfort and peace, knowing that people around you are going to spend eternity in hell? And perhaps you are the one who is in position to see the trajectory of their lives change. Or are you willing to risk a little discomfort? Maybe have a little embarrassment once in a blue moon. So that they might see, hear, and know who Jesus is and what he's done. I mean, let me be very honest, guys. Like, not like I'm a superhero, but I almost got my butt beat in Boston trying to share the gospel with people, right? Like, I literally put my life on the line to share the good news with people. Yet, that's not something that is just a cursory part of my story. As I travel for, airport, for CSU, I go through airports, and I ride Ubers, and I do all these things. And what do I do? I have conversations with people. And sometimes it's uncomfortable. Sometimes it's awkward. Sometimes you think it would be better off for me to take the seatbelt off and duck out of this car than to continue on this path. Yet, the Lord has been faithful to give me opportunity to proclaim the gospel message to dozens of people just this year. Not because I'm a superhero, but just simply because I'm faithful to interact and share what God has done in my life with others. And so I would just simply ask you, if you're a Christ follower here today, what is your comfort worth? Are you willing to give up your comfort so that others might know the greatness of King Jesus and what he has done? Or do you want to cling tightly to yourself, loving the world, and abandoning those who will spend eternity separated from God? The heart of this call to the gospel, it begins with obedience. And if you're a Christ follower, that obedience begins when you recognize who you are and begin living and walking in lockstep with King Jesus. 
But maybe you're here and you're not a Christ follower. Maybe you're here and you're hearing some of this for the first time. Or maybe you're not even sure where you are on this journey. Wherever you are, whatever you're doing, this story begins with obedience. And it's obedience to this message that you are a sinner who's in need of grace. You are someone who desperately needs salvation. You're someone who's so valuable to the Father that He would send His Son to live the life that we could not, to bear the weight of our sin and shame, so that He might call us children. This is a God who loves and cares for you. And if you're here and you're thinking, I'd love to know more about this, this this step begins with obedience, trusting in Jesus, proclaiming that He is who He says He is, repenting of your sins, and following Him. My hope and my prayer is that today that is indeed what you would do. That you, no matter where you are in your journey, would choose obedience to Jesus. If I may, could I go to the Lord in prayer for us as we continue in our time of worship? Let's pray. Father, thank you for today. Thank you for your grace and mercy. Thank you for this truth that you have come to seek and save the lost. Lord, it is our prayer that this gospel message would go forth having transformed our own lives and in transforming the lives of others that we encounter. It's our prayer that you would begin an awakening here in Charleston so that every man, woman, and child would have multiple opportunities to see, hear, and respond to the good news of Jesus. Lord, we are grateful for you. We're thankful that you are still in the business of saving people. And we're so grateful that you have demonstrated your goodness and kindness to us today. Lord, we thank you for all you've done for us. We pray these things in your name. Amen. Amen. Well, church family, we are now going to transition into a time of, uh, before we sing, uh, a time of uh, the Lord's Supper. So um, at this time, I'm going to read a passage of scripture before we continue, but ask the deacons, you can go ahead and come forward uh, to the two sections for being able to serve. Um, But in the scriptures, we see... Um, in uh, the book of uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, and the words will be there on the screen. I'm going to read this to you and give you a quick explanation. Uh, Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then, and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. That is why many of you are weak and ill, and some have died. But if we judged ourselves truly, we would not be judged. But when we are judged by the Lord, we are disciplined, so that we may not be condemned along with the world. So then, my brothers, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. If anyone is hungry, let him eat at home, so that when you come together, it will not be for judgment about the other things I will give directions when I come. When Paul's writing to the church at Corinth here, he's writing, describing there are those that are um, overeating and indulging in things, and they're going to partake in the Lord's Supper in an unworthy manner. And so we always want to address that fact and make it clear. Before we partake in the Lord's Supper, the Lord's Supper is for Uh, Christians only. So uh, please make note of that. If you have not decided to follow Jesus and you have not had that transformation in your life, please uh, do not partake in the Lord's Supper. We will not call you out or anything like that. Just want to make that clear to you. Uh, Maybe also there is some sin or something in your life and uh, you have not repented of that and it's just a a weight that's there and you're, you're not willing to let go of that yet. I would encourage you, please do not partake of this time either. But maybe you do need prayer and somebody to pray with you before you you partake, and you can come forward, you can let Walter or I know, and we will gladly pray with you, uh, but we're going to take a moment to silently uh, wait and uh, pray for a moment, and then uh, the deacons are here, they're going to serve you and encourage you, anybody that wants to come forward to get uh, any of the elements, you can take those back to your seats, and um, and then Walter is going to lead us in the Lord's Supper so that I can uh, partake in the Lord's Supper with Adeline for the first time. Uh, so if you would, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, I pray, Lord, uh, as we engage in this time now of honoring you through the ordinance of the Lord's Supper, Father, if there is any sin in our lives, Lord, anybody in here that says, you know, I've 
been wrestling with this, and I just want to be free of it, Lord. Draw them to repentance now, Father. May they can repent of that and confess it unto you, Lord, so that you can do an important, transformative, sanctifying work in their life, Lord. God, I pray, Lord, that as we go into this time, Lord, now, as we continue in worship right now, Father, that this would be a time of exalting you, remembering your body that was broken for us, Lord, your blood that was shed on our behalf. God, that you would continue to do a transformative work in our lives for your glory. Father, we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Anybody that wants to come forward can now come forward. As you've probably seen, there are a few flaps you'll want to open up to get to the various items for the Lord's Supper. Uh, the first portion is going to be the bread. You can flip that open. I'm going to read two verses for us. The first is John 6, 51. I am the living bread that came down out of heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. Then in Luke 22, verse 19, it says, And he took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me, if you would partake of the bread. Next, we'll partake of the, the grape juice, uh, the wine, as it were. Hebrews 9, verse 22 reads, Indeed, under the law, almost everything is purified with blood. And without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. 1 Corinthians eleven twenty five 25 reads, In the same way also he took the cup. After supper, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. You may partake. After the Lord and his disciples ate the bread and drank the wine, celebrating the first Lord's Supper, it's said that they sang a hymn and went out. So if you would, would you join us in standing and singing this last song of celebration today? This is a song of celebration, so feel free to clap and just sing joyously. Thank you. Is 
a seat a few brief announcements for you guys to be in the loop on things at first next week we'll be jumping back into our last mini series in the book of acts we'll be finishing the book in the next few weeks but special treat for you you will have pastor david living speaking to us next week it will not be brian and i which means you might end on time so let's see what may happen there also want you to remember that Women After God, the semester luau is going to be Tuesday at 6.30 p.m. You can see Trisha or Tara. If you've got questions, they'll flag you down. Trisha, Tara, wave. There we go. You guys know who they are. Find them. See them if you have questions. They're going to break for the summer and pick up back in September. Park Circle Youth is going to be meeting next Sunday. So again, see Trisha if you are Tara and Trisha if you got questions. Trisha can answer questions too, but see Tara particularly. She'll answer any questions you might have. With that in mind, I want to go ahead and pray for us and wrap up our time of worshiping the Lord today. If you would, go ahead. We're going to just make sign language till we do something. <laughs> All right, guys. Um, one thing that I meant to say while we were doing the baptism is now that Adeline is baptized, we are baptizing her into membership here at Holmes Avenue. So if you are a member here at Holmes, would you affirm that you would um, uh, welcome her into our church family by just saying amen? Amen. amen. And uh, she'll be up here and you can awkwardly come up and make her feel all blushy and excited. We're happy for you, baby. All right.
<laughs> she loves the attention. Don't let her lie to you. Let me pray for us. Father, thank you for today. Thank you for your grace and mercy. Thank you for this beautiful moment to celebrate your goodness and your grace. Lord, thank you for bringing Adeline into the family of God and into this church. We're grateful for you and what you're doing in her life. Bless us this week. Send us out as missionaries into a lost and dying world so that we might proclaim the good news of what Jesus has done for us. We pray these things in your name, Jesus. Amen. We love you guys. Hope you have a great week.